Santa. Hello, uh, this is Adam Smith. Oh, oh hi, hi. <laughs> I was warned that you would call. <laughs> <laughs> well, many, many congratulations on the news. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You sound remarkably calm and collected. <laughs> well, I've discussed it with my wife at length already, I must admit. Mm -hmm. uh, it sounds like your wife is a calming influence then. Yes, certainly. She is. <laughs> <laughs> how, how did you receive the news? So I was just gulping down the last cup of tea to go and pick up my uh, daughter at her uh, nanny, where she has had an overnight stay. And then I got this call from Sweden, and I, of course, thought it had something to do with our little summer hut in Sweden. I thought, oh, the lawnmower has broken down or something. Um, <laughs> did, you, did you manage to get to collect your, uh, your, your daughter? Uh, I am going now, actually. <laughs> I gather today is a holiday in Germany. Yes, it's a day of German unification. So it's very calm here. Everything is closed. That's, that's a peculiar day in a way to receive the news because otherwise you would have been at the Institute and you would have been surrounded by masses of people, I suppose, popping champagne. But as it is, you mm -hmm. can perhaps have a quieter introduction to life as a laureate than most. Uh, yes, yes. And I can go out and buy some champagne when the shop's open tomorrow morning and come well equipped to the Institute. <laughs> I can't imagine that celebrations would really be delayed for 24 hours, though. I'm sure they'll be. It's, I remember when we were together in Stockholm in 2012 um, for that Nobel Week dialogue mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. on genetics. And then you were sit sitting at the Nobel banquet um, the next day. And I guess maybe you've been to the Nobel banquet before. I just wondered whether sitting at the banquet you'd ever imagined yourself being the recipient of the prize. No, really not. I sort of, you know, I have received a couple of prizes before, but I somehow did not think that this really would be uh, qualify for a Nobel Prize. <laughs> <laughs> Your work is, of course, on the sequencing of these early homonyms. What does our knowledge, your knowledge of the um, genetic makeup of those species tell us about our relationship with them? Well, it does tell us that we are very closely related, first of all, and we're actually so closely related so that they have contributed quite directly 50, 60,000 years ago DNA to the ancestors of most people today, those who have their roots outside Africa. And that variation, that sort of those variants do have an influence and influence many things in our physiology today. Mm -hmm. Do you think that changes our view of ourselves, knowing that? In some sense, I do think it does so. The sort of realization that until quite recently, maybe 14,000, 1400 generations ago or so, there were other forms of humans around and they mixed with our ancestors and have contributed to us today. The fact that you know, the last 40,000 years is quite unique in human history in that we are the only form of humans around. Until that time, there were almost always other groups, types of humans that existed. Hmm. Yeah, that should change our view of our place in the world, shouldn't it? Yes. I think so. I mean, sometimes I, I think it's interesting to think about if Neanderthals had survived another 40,000 years, how would that influence us? Would we see even worse racism against Neanderthals because they were really in some sense different from us? Or would we actually see our place in the living world quite in a different way when we would have other forms of humans there that were very like us but still different. We wouldn't make this very clear distinction between animals and humans that we do so easily today. Mm. Mm. The 
own press release uses the word seemingly impossible for the task you undertook. I was wondering what... Really? Gave... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was wondering what gave you the confidence, the courage to undertake a seemingly impossible piece of research. Well, it is, of course, uh, a step-by-step -step process that started back in the, in the 80s. I must struggle to retrieve a little bit of DNA from things that were just a few, starting with, with just dried tissues that, uh, you know, tis, um, that were just a few months old, going back in time and struggling with the technological issues with that over, over a decade. And then it became possible to retrieve DNA from things like as mammoths or, or cave bears that lived at a similar time as the Neanderthals. And then I was very lucky to, to get a job in Germany where, of course, Neanderthals is a big hmm. presence in, our, in the imagination of people. So it was then very, an obvious next step, in a way, to try to do that. <laughs> You make it all sound very logical, but uh, <laughs> I think there's an understatement there. Um, you, of course, um, have a, a, a Nobel laureate lineage, um, and a, um, your father was a Nobel laureate. Does that make a difference to you in receiving the prize? To some extent, I'm sure. Uh, it, it, yes, it does. I mean, I think the biggest influence in my life was for sure my mother with whom I grew up. Mm. And in some sense, if something, it makes me a bit sad that she uh, can't experience this day. She sort of was very much into science and very much stimulated and encouraged me through the years. My father, I did have some contact to and he took a big interest in, in my work but it was not that close a relationship as with my mother. Mm. I was just wondering whether there's some sense in which um, Suna Bergström or maybe other laureates or great scientists had given you, again, that sort of approach, that confidence, or had helped you acquire the confidence to undertake mm. such major challenges. Maybe also the realists a bit that one had restless, I realize that also uh, such people are normal human beings and it's not such an amazing thing you can, that you may have bigger confidence to try uh, sort of challenging things on yourself. That is indeed a very important point, a very important lesson, yes. People are inclined to put everybody on pedestals, but of course... Yes, and you don't put your parents on the pedestal, <laughs> at least not when you're a teenager. Ah, tell me about it. <laughs> uh, I should let you go and pick up your daughter and get on and enjoy your what seems to be looking like um, a relatively quiet day. Um, but, yes, um, yes. Uh, I think it may be quite good that it's a holiday today, so I can collect my wits till tomorrow <laughs> well, yes, you, you sound like you have all your wits about you in a quite remarkable way anyway it's been a, an absolute joy to speak to you and congratulations mm -hmm. again have a splendid day and thank you thanks yeah bye 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 if you enjoyed this moment we have another special episode you won't want to miss on nobel prize origin stories we present clips of laureates recalling formative moments and Adam explores the unexpected factors that can shape the lives and careers of these great minds. Find it on Acast or wherever you listen to podcasts.